Hello, welcome back to my channel. I'm Kat, this is Kat Makes, and today we are doing a forensic sewing deep dive into the 1949 Christian Dior Junon dress. If this is your first one, Forensic Sewing is a series where we take a garment as seen in uh, pop culture, red carpet, or TV show, or in this case in a museum, and break it down into its component parts so that we can learn a little bit about it. And my goal for this series is to tell you a couple things that you might not have known and encourage you to think about garment construction in all its forms. So with that, let's get right into it. Junon was part of Dior's 1949 to 1950 fall winter collection, and she has a sister dress whose name is Venus. Junon and her sister dress Venus were inspired by Roman gods. And before we get into the construction, I think it's really important to understand the historical context because it really hammers home just how revolutionary this dress was at the time. So, World War II ended in 1945. The styles of the era were utilitarian, severe silhouettes, big shoulder pads, and fabric was scarce because production of most fabrics had been relegated to war effort manufacturing. Fabric was so scarce that there were limits on the number of pockets you could put on a garment in Britain, and the sweep of the skirts got really narrow. Junon has an obscene amount of fabric in one skirt for 1949, only four years after the end of the war, and considering rationing wasn't over everywhere as late as 1947 because it had been relegated to post-war reparation efforts. Dior, to his credit, has this well-documented desire for things to go back to the way they were before the war. He was inspired by Victorian styles, the Renaissance, classic silhouettes, and he wanted to live in the sort of rosy retrospective of how things used to be. This era for Dior is called the new look. Junon was made by Dior for a San Francisco department store called I Magnin Company. It was meant to be used originally as window display to get people to come into the store and buy stuff. It was just going to be sitting there looking pretty. And other dresses made for this purpose were frequently sold to wealthy clientele that would frequent the store. But the story goes that upon seeing the dresses, Grover Magnin, who was the owner of the store at the time, immediately decides that they're museum pieces and not for sale. And he decides to donate them to the San Francisco Museum of Fine Art. However, he does make sure they go through a full and complete publicity tour first, worn by many actresses and models before they're given to the museum. There's a newspaper interview from 1949 about the dresses, and Grover answered a handful of questions. One line in particular stands out, and I feel just really illuminates what fashion culture was like at the time, and also, you know, tells us a thing or two about Grover. The line reads, Dior started the natural shoulder line because as an artist, he knew no matter how ugly a woman might be, her shoulders would always be lovely. <laughs> by contrast, Dior himself actually seems like a pretty cool dude by 1940s standards. His entire staff was women, and at the time Junon was made, this included his advisors, which was very rare for this time period, but he still clings to this idea, this really specific retrospective vision it, that's really at odds with this forward-looking vision that most people had in the World War II era. The reception to Junon was shock and awe. Remember, women are used to these narrow knee-length skirts, and now suddenly, th is this what the French are telling me I need to be wearing these days? The skirt length alone is several inches longer than they'd become accustomed to, and this style of dress required many, many more meters of fabric than the dresses that they were used to wearing. It wasn't all sunshine and roses for Dior. The Little Below the Knee Club, founded in 1947, which coincides with Dior's debut fashion show in February of that year, they weren't super thrilled to be wearing long voluminous skirts anymore. Two inches below the knee was considered their appropriate length, and they picketed with catchy slogans on their signs like, Mr. Dior, we abhor dresses to the floor, and we won't revert to grandma's skirt. In my research, I also saw mention of something called the League of Broke Husbands, who were protesting spending all of that money on skirt fabric, although I couldn't find a direct reference or a newspaper article, so don't quote me on that. Many women, however, loved the look, and Dior himself was going to proceed regardless with his vision. He wrote later, looking back on this time period, something that I really just feel illustrates his mindset at the time. He says, what was heralded as a new style was merely the genuine natural expression of the kind of fashion I wanted to see. It just so happened that my personal inclinations coincided with the general mood for the times and thus became the fashion watchword. It was as if Europe had tired of dropping bombs and now wanted to let off a few fireworks. There's a couple of things going on here, right? I feel like that's really beautiful, but also it really does just illustrate that he was going to do what he was going to do regardless of what anyone thought, and it was just a function of the times that it was so well received. After that initial publicity tour, Grover Bagden did keep to his word and donate Junon to the San Francisco Museum of Fine Arts, and that means that Junon has been a museum piece for almost her entire life, which is really interesting from a research perspective because it means she's held in people's minds as a piece of art, and often clothing does not get that treatment. 
statement in history books. That said, what can we learn about the construction of this dress? How was it made? What techniques were used? And how might we apply these techniques to our own practice? Let's start with the construction of the skirt. Junan's skirt is comprised of 45 individually shaped petals. No petal is the same as any other, and the skirt is not symmetrical. The dress is machine sewn and hand finished, which means construction goes together on the machine and things like hem and seam finishes and everything else inside the dress is done by hand. We have a wide full skirt with a hemline that's a little bit shorter in the front with a small train at the back, and the bodice is comparatively small and plain. It shares the embellishment of the clear sequins but doesn't carry up any of the color, and it has this horizontally pleated neckband of unembellished silk tulle along the top that travels under the arm and around to the back. It also has an unembellished plain silk tulle waistband, and the center back of the bodice meets in a v-shape. It looks like it might have a little bit of an overlap, like it's wrapping over itself. We'll come back to that later. Below that, the waistband is tied. Here's the fun fact you might not know about Junon. The dress was originally blue. Obviously, museum lighting varies greatly, but there are a handful of color photos from 1949 when the dress went on its press tour, and they all give it this distinct light blue coloring, whereas now, for the most part, it appears a sort of antique white or cream color. It's impossible to know how the fabric was dyed or exactly what shade it might have been, but in that original newspaper article, you know, the one where Grover Magnet is calling women ugly, the dress is also described as a dress with petal after petal of green to royal sequins on pale blue tulle, looking like an enfolded peacock's tail. She was definitely originally blue. In addition to that subtle higher in the front, low train in the back situation, the skirt is also fuller in the back than it is in the front and the skirt would have been worn with a separate crinoline for support, and it's interesting to me that some museums have differing opinions on what the width of that crinoline should have been. In some displays it's quite narrow and the skirt is a lot more folded in on itself, and others it's very full and the petals lie almost flat. Inside of the skirt there's a structure that we don't know too much about because there aren't any pictures. However, we know from Dior's writings at the time and a few other pieces of documentation that the inner structure is made from a combination of taffeta plus a densely woven silk called file. This is sometimes also called gros de tour, and it's got like a similar texture to a gros grain ribbon, except it's yardage of fabric instead of just a ribbon. We don't know exactly how these fabrics were used or what exactly the skirt on the inside looks like, because I have been wholly unable to find any photos of the inside of the skirt. But based on some writings that Dior did at the time, plus some samples of other garments from the New Look era, my guess is that the silk gros de tour is used by pleating it into these smaller areas and then letting those pleats open loose in areas where he wants to add volume. Dior, as we know, is very inspired by Victorian dresses, and there's one quote in particular I just love so much because it really sums up him, and also it sums up me a little bit as well. It goes like this. One story tells how on a visit to New York, he would disappear for long periods of time into the storage rooms of the collection at the Metropolitan Museum, where he would be found, enveloped in a Victorian gown, only his legs revealed beneath, staring upwards and busily taking notes about the garment's elaborate construction. I like to think that Dior would be tickled pink to think that 70 years later somebody would want to crawl under one of his dresses and stare upward to see what they could learn about his own elaborate construction, but I'm definitely that person. But let's get back to the petals. The De Young Museum in San Francisco, which hosts this dress in its permanent collection, has an article where they say that the petals are silk tulle lined with horsehair, and then further down in the same article they say silk tulle supported with horsehair. These two sentences, like the way that they're structured, those two words are very important and two things come to mind, but with a little bit of deductive reasoning we can figure out what's going on. Horsehair canvas is a fabric that's often used in tailoring to add structure especially to the lapels and upper chest area of men's suits and sometimes dresses as well, but horsehair canvas is opaque. The other thing it could be, and spoiler alert, the thing that it is, is horsehair braid. Horsehair canvas is actually still made with real hair from horses' manes and tails, but horsehair braid started to be made with nylon around 1930, which means by the time Christian Dior was designing Junon, it had been made with nylon for almost 20 years. The dress gives us a clue as to which one of these two things it is. You can see through some of the petals, so we know it's not the opaque horsehair canvas. Instead, in some of the detail photos, you can see an edging around the petals, which indicates there's something going on around the edge of the petal for support, and in the super super detailed photos that the De Young Museum has on their website where they talk about the restoration of the sequins on Junon and her sister dress Venus, you can actually see right through the tool to the weave of the horsehair, which is slightly different. In this photo from the restoration of Junon, you can also see a little poof of tulle poking out from underneath the petal, so it looks like these pleated poofs of tulle were used to add an additional 
traditional rounded shape to each petal. But also, where's the bodice in this picture? The bodice is a separate piece. It's detachable. So let's talk about that. The bodice is relatively simple in compared to the complex elegance of the skirt. It's strapless, there are two darts under the bust, and it's heavily boned, which we can tell because it's often displayed on mannequins that are just a little bit too small for it, and it stands out away from the bust of those mannequins fully on its own, which means it can stand under its own weight, right? In this case, the boning does go up over the bust, which helps to create that smooth bust silhouette that you get from wearing something like a corset, as opposed to the silhouette you'd get from modern underwires. We know that internally it's either coutil or bobinet, Dior's two preferred support fabrics for bodices at the time, and if you ask me, I'm fairly certain that it's bobinet over coutil. We also know that the silk tool is underlined with a different opaque silk in the bodice, because unfortunately we can see just how shattered that silk is in this photo. So our three layers are pretty standard. The sequins that are embroidered onto the tool, we're gonna come back to those sequins, the opaque silk, and then an internal coutil or bobinet layer, which is used to hold the boning and add structure to the dress. Again, as with the skirt, I can't find any photos of the inside of the bodice, and there's actually no written mention anywhere online that I can find that states that Junon has a separate bodice. We only have two photos to use as clues. The first one I've already shown you, it's that photo of the skirt on the mannequin from the De Young Museum's restoration article, and that article mostly talks about sequin preservation and not the construction of the dresses at all. And there's one other photo, it's talking about a menswear collection that was made by Dior and inspired by the dress, which features this photo of someone handling the boxed Junon, revealing not only the skirt separate from the bodice, but also the unembellished section of bodice continuing down past the visible waistline of the dress. Let's hop back to what this looks like on a mannequin. It looks like the back has a wrap. If I were making this dress, I'd want to attach each end of the wrap to a point on the waistband to secure the bodice to the skirt. And we actually have a couple of clues about how this might have been done. First, going back to this photo, you can see a little coil of fabric around the neck of the mannequin. That's the waist tie of the dress. It's completely separate. Second, if we zoom in a little bit, and I know it starts to get a little bit grainy here because I'm pushing things to the limits, but you can just make out this little teeny tiny piece poking out of the waistband at the side of the skirt, exactly in the right spot where you might like to tie a wrap back bodice or perhaps loop it through to secure it. Could it be that simple? I suspect there's probably something more going on back there, but it's impossible to know what that might be. Signe Noir, another dress from the same fall winter collection in Dior's new look, has a statement as part of its museum documentation that says that it closes with a quote, complex series of fastenings. We know that Dior loves a complicated system. We can also be pretty confident that the two ties on the waist, assuming there is one on the other side, is not the only thing holding this low-backed, heavily boned bodice fully upright on a human lady with any kind of bust support. And we know it was worn a fair bit by the actresses and models before it was donated to the museum. For this, we come back to the second photo of the bodice in the box. But before we talk about it, we need to do a super quick crash course on corselets. Corselets are inbuilt support structures. Corsets are separate garments that are meant to be worn under clothes to shape the wearer, and corselets are sewn physically into dresses. They have several purposes, and they can look a lot of different ways depending on the dress that they're supporting and their own purpose within that dress, but specifically for our discussion, the things you need to know are as follows. Point number one, a corslet is built into a dress to support the shape of the dress foremost, and secondarily sometimes to augment the shape of the wearer to get a particular silhouette without undergarments. This is important because of that low, low back. She's not wearing a bra and her bust is still held somehow, so we know there's some kind of internal support structure going on. Second, we know that Dior was a huge fan of corslets. Again, unfortunately, I've got nothing on Junon other than that one photo of the boxed bodice, which we are gonna come back to just in a moment, but we do have a handful of photos of other Dior dresses from around a similar time period that show the types of corslets he'd likely use. For example, this one out of Claire Schaefer's book, Couture Sewing Techniques. This is a particularly good example because you can see the corslet is hip length, even though the embellishment on the dress finishes at the waist, and you can also see that the outer portion of the dress wraps around and over that central hook and eye fastening, and the outer layer is quite separate from the back of the corslet itself. Obviously, the major difference here is that our dear Junon has a separate bodice and skirt, and it's important that you know that I am fully guessing here, because there's no evidence for what's actually going on inside that bodice or how it closes. But I believe that the bodice has a center back hook and eye closure all the way down to the hip beyond the visible waistline of the skirt, and that the wings of the back wrap over each other. The underlap wing likely doesn't have any sequins underneath where the wrap is, so like we're under where that layer is, because there's no point. 
and it ties at each side of the waist. It's also possible that there are a few other hooks and eyes scattered around to keep everything in place. And after the top is done up and after the skirt is on, the waist tie, which we do know is a completely separate piece, is tied around the waist with a bow at the back and the tails tucked in, as Dior rightfully intended. It is not, and this is a dig, but I won't tell you which museum committed this absolute atrocity. Not just dangling down the back of the dress, the absolute heathens. Anyways, let's talk about the sequins next. You didn't think that I was going to do a whole deep dive on Junon and not talk about the sequins, did you? Let's get back into things we know. The dress is adorned with sequins that follow the shape of the petals on the skirt. Junon is the French translation of the Roman god Juno, and her sacred animal is the peacock. The dress is meant to emulate peacock feathers. It's stitched by French embroidery house Ray Bay, which is named after its founder, René Begway. This is actually quite a departure from Ray Bay's usual style. Generally, he prefers a wider color range, lots of florals, and he has this really amazing technique that he uses where he embroiders thread and then he tucks sequins in between the layers so that they're peeking out, which at the time was very unique to him. And also it feels a little bit reminiscent of gold work, which I think is really, really cool considering there's not a lot of gold work in the photos that I've seen of his work. There's a book by Nadia Albertini if you're interested and some of Ray Bay's other work. I haven't actually seen the inside because it's not available in New Zealand and very expensive to ship here, but it is a singular source of knowledge on Ray Bay's work, and one day I'd love to be able to see the inside of that book. But back to the sequins, though. I need to give you another brief history lesson so that you understand just how wild it is that this dress even exists. This, again, could be its very own history episode, so I'm going to try to keep things light. King Tut's tomb was discovered in 1922, and his burial robes were covered in these tiny flat metal discs, and although sequins had been around in this format, they experienced a huge uplift in popularity as folks in the 1920s became fascinated with King Tut and with ancient Egypt. Metal, of course, was too heavy for the number of sequins that people wanted to stitch onto their delicate garments, and it would end up just ripping right down out of fabrics. So there was a lot of effort focused on developing lighter weight sequins. There are two main methods around this time period. One was cellulose acetate, which was also used in the film industry, and then there's gelatin, which you guessed correctly is the same stuff that jello is made out of. Cellulose acetate was super brittle, so sequins broke frequently and those sharp edges could actually cut into the wearer and draw blood, and it was also super flammable, so gelatin became the clear winner. Drying sheets of gelatin and plating them with then often lead-based colors became the main method of production. This method continued until plastic and other non-brittle cellulose alternatives were developed, and even then some fashion houses were reticent to adopt the alternatives because in couture embroidery especially there's this huge emphasis on upholding historical practices, which means that new technology doesn't get adopted very quickly. After that, DuPont invented mylar in 1952 and techniques improved from there, and so sequins are no longer made of gelatin, but they were still being made out of gelatin at the time period. But what does any of this have to do with Junon? The De Young Museum, where Junon is a permanent resident, holds this quote on their website. This dress is embellished with blue, green, and orange gelatin sequins. The problem, you may have guessed, is that gelatin melts when it's too hot, and it also melts when it gets too wet. We can't wash this dress, but also any wearer is risking melting the sequins with the heat and the sweat of their own bodies, especially in the underarm area, which may have been why Junon has this band of fabric across the top. There's an article about the restoration of the sister dress Venus, says what we learned about Venus informed the treatment of Junon, and then directly goes goes on to discuss their special goat hair bristle vacuum cleaner, and if you read between the lines, it kind of sounds like somebody might have washed a sequin and watched it dissolve, but who's to say? Not me, certainly. The sequins are stitched using tamper embroidery on silk tool. Remember, it was blue at the time, and only sequins are used, unlike the sister dress Venus, which also introduces other elements like beads, paillettes, pearls, etc various sizes, colors, and also a mix of flat and cup sequins, which we learned in my Learn Tamer Embroidery series, are introduced for various textures and degrees of sparkle, and I just love this depth. What's really cool is that overall it's a relatively simple embroidery design, it's kind of almost impressionistic, and it's fully made up of just these squiggly lines that decrease in intensity and saturation towards the middle of the petal. 
Don't mistake the simple design with simple execution though, it definitely has an impact. On the dress, there are some areas of overlap where you can see the colors of the sequins through other layers of petals and other areas the embroidery stops under the feathers. On the petal, we also have an additional backing of silk tulle, which is used to protect the embroidery and the threads, and also to enclose that horsehair edging that we know is, in is included in this dress as well. Around the edges, sequins are attached in that vermicelli stitch, which again, we learned about in my Learned Timber Embroidery series. I'll link the video where I talk about it. And Rube has also varied the stitch length in order to vary the density of the sequins. Some areas are so close that the sequins almost look like they're stacked up on top of each other, and other areas the sequins are quite disperse. As you get further away from the edges of the petal, the sequins are attached in separate clusters instead of being all stitched kind of right on top of each other, and we can tell if we look very closely that the thread is actually cut in between each cluster of sequins, which is such a time-intensive move compared to leaving the thread intact, and also opens the opportunity that more knots might fail over time, and we do know that Junon has an issue with sequin attrition, as the museum so lightly puts it. Sequins are falling off of the skirt every time it moves. Also, in a huge demonstration of attention to detail, the thread matches the sequins. Blue sequins are stitched with dark blue thread, lighter sequins are stitched with light thread. The thread matches all the way around. This was a labor of love, this dress. As a quick aside, Glinda's Bubble Dress from Wicked, which was one of the mini gowns inspired by Junon, has a similar embroidery, but you can clearly see the line of thread connecting the sequins, which is a much different and much more efficient method where time is concerned than separating them individually. Between the shattered silk and the bodice lining, the silk tool used for the embroidery base, the gelatin sequins and the thread used, we know that Junon is in an incredibly fragile state. She's held in climate control, she's carefully cleaned with a goat hair vacuum cleaner, and the Dion Museum is doing everything possible to keep this dress intact. It's such a wonderful piece of history. As much as I am certain that Grover Magnin and I would not have been friends if we'd met in real life, I am really grateful that he had the foresight to donate this dress to the museum when he did, because if it had been sold to a San Francisco socialite after spending time in the window display of I, Magnin and Company, it likely wouldn't have survived, especially in the condition that it's in now, in order to inspire generations of sewists and other designers to make so many recreations throughout history and give us such an opportunity to investigate it in this level of detail. So I hope you enjoyed the forensic sewing deep dive on Junon. I still feel like I have so many unanswered questions about this dress. One day I'd love to see photos of the inside of the skirt, the inside of the bodice, and get up close and personal with those sequins in that closure in a way that we just can't in photos. In the meantime, I hope I've taught you a thing or two that you may not have known about Junon, and if you have a suggestion for a forensic sewing deep dive you'd like to see in the future, please let me know in the comments. Otherwise, see you next time. Bye!